Did the Chinese know something that they weren't prepared to talk about? It would appear that they did. Now, in America, we have an equally impressive character as head of the American space program, Werner von Braun. We know him as an SS officer using concentration camp labor to build the V-2 rockets that fell on London, the back part of the war, second part, part of the Second War. He decided when he could see which way it was going to get out, handed himself over to the Americans, landed up in Fort Bliss in Texas with about a hundred other uh, Russian, uh, German rocket technicians. And that was the nucleus of the whole moon program. This here you may be familiar with if you've seen the film 2001. This is what Werner von Braun designed in 1952. Now, he was quite famous in America. He was promoting the space program. He promoted it basically from the early 1950s, that America should go into space. His overriding ambition was to land on the moon. That was what he intended to do. Now, at some point, after Kennedy made the announcement, and the landing on the moon, which was 40 years ago, in three weeks' time, 1969, at some point, a decision was made that landing a man on the moon was quite easy. The problem was getting him back alive. And as it was all going to happen live on television, so we're told, a spaceman, an astronaut, dying was not quite what the Americans had in mind. So it would appear there was a backup plan. And this is the man who was asked to implement it. Walt Disney. What was Walt Disney's great stock in trade? He could create fantasy. He was brilliant as an animator, as a filmmaker, and politically, he and Von Braun get on rather well. They both came from the same right-hand end of the political spectrum. Now, if you're going to go to the moon, you've got to practice. You've got to work out what it's going to look like. You've got to create various images of the moon. What we have here is a big 20-foot globe. It still exists today, it's in San Francisco. Made up to look much similar to the moon, and for a very good reason, there's nothing secret about any of this. It was so that film cameras could be mounted on tracks. Anybody who's worked in the film business will know that's how you do tracking shots. So in order for the astronauts who are going to be in their simulators, the lunar landers, the command modules, they'll want to know what's happening outside the window as you approach the moon, what's it going to look like? So you film it and project it onto the windows outside the simulators. Nothing secret about that at all. There's one interesting point that there's the globe made up, and this is a more detailed version of it, and this one here is actually quite a large thing. These are two people at the bottom here. Quite a large version, and we're told, of the Sea of Tranquility. In this one here, you see there's a little girder at the top. There's a little light. These are the girders of the warehouse in which the uh, globe is made. They're going to feature later. Watch out for them. So having created the uh, simulation sets, they need bigger sets. They need bigger simulators. And this is built, this one here, is built at Hampton in Virginia, quite near what is now the CIA headquarters. It was in order to provide the environment whereby a lunar lander could have five-sixths of its weight removed so that you could test out what it was going to be like. They also did it for people as well. Again, nothing secret about this. A lot of people knew this was going on. And this is what you would expect to happen. When you built the spacesuits, you have to do the simulations to find out what it's going to be like when you're wearing them. And this is Neil Armstrong practicing getting his little lump of rock and probably practicing his 
one small step. He would have recorded it, obviously, this was simulation, and all simulations are recorded and photographed, as you would expect. When you're going to land on the moon, you need to fly a pretty strange craft, the lunar lander. You've got to practice that as well. And here we run into a major problem, that this is the best, known as the flying bedstead, and this is the thing that was used to train the astronauts to land the lunar lander on the moon. They couldn't use the real thing because it would collapse. It wasn't strong enough. It wasn't made to be strong enough. Unfortunately, it kept crashing. And that's Neil Armstrong bailing out when uh, <coughs> it went wrong. And they tended to go wrong. And it should be borne in mind that no astronaut had successfully landed a craft on the lunar surface, obviously, before he got there, but he hadn't done it on Earth either. Anyway, let's go off to the moon, have a look what happened up there. The Saturn V rocket, with its, um, similar to the V2 markings, actually, that's 365 foot high, high to St. Paul's Cathedral. It weighs the same as the roof over Wimbledon Centre Court, 3,000 tons. Big piece of kit. And at the top of it are three astronauts. Right up there. This is Apollo 11. So Aldrin, Armstrong and Collins will be on the top. The rocket leaves the ground, clears the tower. And between that happening and splashdown, well, it's 8, 10, 12 days later, there's only one source of information that we have access to. No independent verification has ever taken place of anything that occurred after liftoff and before splashdown. We rely on NASA to provide that information. So what does NASA stand for? National Aeronautics and Space Administration, obviously. Or possibly not. Possibly, never a straight answer. Possibly, not always scientifically accurate. Because they don't answer the question. I've asked them several questions. They've never answered. Now, having taken off, the one thing we do know that's going to happen is that we have to get through the Van Allen radiation belts. These are generated by the sun and the Earth's magnetic field. There's the Earth in the middle there. And these are the Earth's magnetic fields, which basically form a type of breakwater to allow the solar wind from the sun to go around the Earth. But in doing so, it traps highly radioactive particles, electrons, neutrons, protons, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff, which doesn't do humans much good. It doesn't extend out as far as the moon. The moon is totally unprotected. The Earth is protected. And these were discovered in 1958 by Professor James Van Allen, who put a Geiger counter at the top of Explorer 1, sent it up on one of the uh, first rockets, and the thing stopped working. It just didn't, fun it didn't function and they realized it had become overloaded. So they put another one on Explorer 3. Explorer 2 blew up. Explorer 3 was sent up with a bigger Geiger counter on, and they found that space was radioactive. Seriously radioactive. However, it doesn't seem to matter if you're an Apollo astronaut. You can go through these things, and it doesn't matter, because none of them have died of radiation poisoning. You're going to the moon. This is the moon. This is one of the pictures that was taken in 1958 by the Lick Observatory in California. It's probably the best series of photographs of the moon. And at this point here is where Apollo 11 allegedly landed on the Sea of Tranquility. Apollo 12, no, Apollo 14 was over here. Apollo 15 up here. Basically, they all landed on the front. This is the equator of the moon, more or less across here. And one of the most prominent features is the Copernicus crater up here. And there's one crater down here, 